Relentless family, God bless you today, wherever you are. Uh, the first thought that my wife and I and this entire team have is for your safety and your protection. We are in unprecedented times. And for all of our family who have been impacted by Hurricane Ian, on the west coast of Florida, across the central portion of Florida, then turning north towards Jacksonville, Brunswick, and then the coast of South Carolina that has been inundated with storm surge of between three to six feet, in some places even more. And even now, as the remnants of Ian travel over the Carolinas, uh, it was important to me as a leader and to this team that not only we made sure that the word of the Lord was going to be released, that the worship of God would be prepared, but that we did something that would keep everyone safe, particularly those who have sacrificed to make uh, this church go. To the people in the sound booth and the control room and our unbelievable camera operators who allow us to have this word prepared to come into your homes, particularly on a day like today, a Sunday like today, a weekend like we've had, a week like we've had, I first want to say thank you. Uh, I, I believe that the church as we know it is evolving and changing. And in moments like this, it's far more important to be safe and to be cautious than to use um, improperly the word faith to open doors that could put people in harm's way. And so today we are gathered, you're at your home, and I hope that you and your family are gathered around whatever device you have decided to worship the Lord around. But I want you to receive the word of the Lord. I want you to get your uh, Bibles ready. I want you to get your, um, your journals ready because I have something that I believe is going to bless your life. Uh, but I want to pray first. So do me a favor, bow your heads right where you are, unless of course you're in your car, don't bow your head. That's not a wise decision. But Lord Jesus, I wanna thank you for life. And God, I ask that you would cause us, as scripture says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The truth is, Lord, life is fragile and in a moment, everything can change. Give us humility of heart, kindness of spirit, and a sense of brotherly and sisterly love that when our brothers and sisters are hurting in one place, we hurt with them. But we don't just hurt. We do whatever it takes to get resources to our family in need. And God, I covenant as the pastor of this church that Relentless will be a part of the healing and recovery process for so many people who have lost everything across multiple states. And for those who lost family members in this massive once in a thousand year storm, I pray Holy Spirit that you would provide comfort to them, healing to them. Hold them in your arms. Don't let these people lose their minds because a storm like this can make you lose your mind. Now speak through your word. We're in part five of our moving day series. God, do something unprecedented. And even though the building is not open, heaven is. Oh God, speak by your power in the holy name of Jesus. I give you great glory for you are the most high God. Bless this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will do me a favor, join me in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. This is part five of our Moving Day series. It is the first Sunday of the fourth quarter. We are in the fourth quarter, y'all. And as Pastor Aventer has already led us in communion, you do know you can take communion 10 times a day. It says, as often as you 
do this. Do it in remembrance of me. If I were you, I'd be taking communion every day with my family and believing God for miracles and promises because the hand of God and the word of God has no expiration date. The anointing does not have an expiration date. All right? So continue in uh, building, as the old folks say, sending up my timber, sending up prayers, laying hands, praying over your family, pray over yourself and if the Lord leads you or you feel led to, take communion every day until something breaks in your favor, all right? We're in Genesis 15. I'm going to start at the 12th verse. Now, if you start at the beginning of Genesis 15, you will see that the Most High God is speaking to Abram, and he says to him, I am your God. I am. I am. I am your shield your exceedingly great reward. I don't know what Abram did in his life to win God, but God says, I'm your reward. And Abram then asked God a question. He says, well, that's amazing, but how are you going to do this? I don't have an heir, and I'm old. All I got is, you know, my nephew. God says, that's not going to be your heir, one from your own body. Abram's like, I'm, I'm old. God, I know you're God, but maybe you didn't see. I'm old, and nothing's working like you used to. God was like, I, I got one more. I got one more for you, and uh, we know how that worked out. But I want you to go with me to verse 12 of Genesis 15 because it's going to set up what God has shown me about this particular aspect of our series. We're in part five of Moving Day. But I want to give you some background on what it is God is doing and was doing and had in the plan the entire time. Genesis 15 and 12 says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. His name is Abram here. He has, his name has not been changed. It's very important to understand that there is a distance between a promise and the fulfillment. And when God decided to fulfill his promise, he expanded and enlarged Abram's territory. He gave not only Abram, but his wife, Sarai, a new name. And so we know with expansion and with elevation and with the arrival of a promise comes a new name. And so here he's still Abram. It's very important because so many of us have incorrectly believed that God is only going to speak to us once we change but I need you to know that God's love is that he will speak to you in the midst of whatever your current situational condition and circumstance is. The state of your soul is inconsequential to the promise of God. I'll say it again. The state of your soul is inconsequential and immaterial to the promise of God. Where you are in a present moment does not change what God has determined for future seasons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the 12th verse, we find Abram. And a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. That feels like a Vincent Price. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. You thought thriller was in scripture. My God, this is a thriller moment. Y'all wasn't ready for that. Ha <laughs> ha! Stop right now. We, these people are trying to get a word. We virtual. Stop playing. Virtual. Comedian. Anyway, all right. So Abram fell asleep, and it literally, in his dream, it became a horror movie. Now let's freeze. Look at life right now. You don't even have to be asleep for it to feel like you're in the middle of a horror movie. The surge in crime across this nation thousands of acres on fire at a time. Unprecedented once in a thousand year storms that are now happening every couple months. Entire ice shelves melting with the specter of entire sea levels rising by feet. And even if we stopped all of our carbon emissions, it would not stop what has already begun. Couple that with a deeply divided world 
wars and rumors of war, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilences in various places. COVID has still not gone away. And now we have new things cropping up. Horror and great darkness. Abram is not the only one that's dealing with horror and great darkness. We are in a time of horror and great darkness. And I fear that even the church is still asleep and wants to stick its proverbial head in the sand and not deal with the truth of where we are. But the truth is, Jesus is coming back sooner than any of us anticipated. So the first thing I need to tell you to do is stop playing with God. Get it right, right now. If you're not saved, if you haven't given Jesus lordship of your life, do it now. Do it now while you are alive, while you have a chance. Do it now. There is a desperation for true salvation and true fellowship with the God who created you. We are in a deeply divided social, political, and racial moment. Financial markets are teetering on the edge of complete collapse. Interest rates are higher than they've been in a generation. And in the midst of all of that, God says, I'm still in control. But am I in control of you? And that, my friends, is called free will. God won't make you serve him. He won't make you honor him. He won't make you revere him. It's your choice. But I can tell you right now, if you make the wrong choice, it could cost you everything. So here in the scripture, 13th verse, then God said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Let me break this scripture down for you. And then we have another scripture and we're going to jump straight into this word. God told Abram almost a thousand years before the actual deliverance of God's people that Abram's descendants, who the first one had not even been born, before I even, before you even manifest the promise that I just made, I need you to know that your descendants will be slaves and strangers in a strange land for 400 years. And after that, I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to bring them out with great possessions. This is what he said. You read it. I read it. This is before Abraham had Isaac. Sarah was not pregnant. God said what it was going to be a millennia before it ever happened. I'm saying that to set up what's coming next. So God made it clear, it's gonna be trouble down the line. Now, Abram had no concept and no construct for what God was saying. He didn't even understand that he was going to be the father of many nations. But God gave him a prophetic glimpse of the trajectory of promise fulfilled, attack from the enemy, bondage, pain, and then the ultimate deliverance and arrival into the promise. God gave Abram the Alpha and the Omega because that's who he is. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. You're at home, but that doesn't stop you from giving God a praise break. Somebody put in the chat feed, he is the Alpha and the Omega. And then give God a shout at your house. Give him a shout in your car. Give him a shout in your office. Give him a shout in that apartment. Go ahead. I'll wait. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God speaks in Genesis 15 about what's about to happen. Now, let's go to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. Let's go all the way to Exodus. We've been talking about the Red Sea, which, by the way, for those who are biblical scholars, you know that the Red Sea is actually the Sea of Reeds. 
and you want to go study that on your own. We don't have time today to get into it. But what we know as the Red Sea crossing was actually the Sea of Reeds. And you can go and study that. Now, Genesis 15, God tells Abram before his wife is even pregnant that your descendants will be slaves and strangers in a strange land 400 years. But I'm going to bring them out with great possessions and then I'm going to judge the nation that did that to them. And in the fourth generation, they will return here. But I have to wait for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is really deep. What God was saying is, I'm kicking some people out of the land, but all of the wrong that they have to do in order for me to kick them out has not been done. So I'm going to give them some time to either turn or to keep going in the wrong direction. And if they fulfill their sin quotient, I'm going to kick them out of the land. What God was saying in this moment, which is so strange, I've never heard this, God was giving grace to the enemy to turn. Now, I'm getting ready to kick you out of this land because of the sin that you're committing. Now, what is that principle that you need to grab? Here's the principle. If there's any sin in your life, get rid of it now. Don't let God take your promise because of sin that you won't address. I'm going to sit that right there. Because in today's church economy, we don't want truth. We want the Bible that is very much Burger King. You want to have it your way. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live how I want to live. And God understands. He made me this way. No, 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 no. I don't get to determine which parts of the Bible that I want to honor and those that I don't. I would love to live my own life and still get the benefits of being in relationship with God. It doesn't work that way. And so here we see God saying that I'm kicking them out of the land. I'm going to give this land to your descendants. I can't give it now because the sin of the people is not complete. I'm giving them a chance to turn and change. God always gives you a chance to turn, always gives you a chance to change. But if you don't, he will kick you out of what belonged to you because sin will cause you to lose real estate. And real estate is not just land. Real estate is promises. Real estate is relationships. Real estate is, is open doors and opportunity. Do not let unrepentant, unconfessed sin keep you from walking into the totality of your promise. Now let's go to Exodus 16. They have, the children of Israel have watched God do miracle signs and wonders to get them free. Moses was then instructed by God, we're not going to go the regular route towards the Canaanites because, uh, was it the Canaanites or the Philistines? Anybody know? I was talking about it last week. See, I was just tricking them. God says, I'm not going to send them this regular route. I got to take them through the wilderness because if they see the people in war, they're going to get nervous. They're going to want to go back to Egypt because they just got free. And until you have a framework for freedom, you will not be able to embrace it and to walk into it. So my body is free, but my mind is in bondage. So here we are. And the children of Israel have watched God do miracle after miracle, death of the firstborn, the drowning of Pharaoh's army. Now, Pharaoh's army is behind them. A pillar of cloud is between the army of the Egyptians and the people of God. It's a cloud on one side. It's fire and light on the other. And they're saying, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into this wilderness for us to die? And Moses then cries out to God, and God says, what are you crying for me, to me about? Tell the people, go forward. Quit crying and go forward. And he said, Moses, stretch out your rod, and the waters will divide this way and that. We know what happened. The children of Israel crossed over on dry ground, and then God allowed the enemy to pursue God's people, and the purpose of it was to eradicate them completely. There are some people that have been chasing you. There are some situations that have been chasing you. There are some things that you couldn't seem to get free from. 
but I need you to let it chase you because God's about to put you in a safe place and he's going to drown the thing that was chasing you. He's going to drown the curse that was chasing you. He's going to drown the individuals or the people or the plot that was trying to take you out. You need to be excited about God's protection. I know it looks like you're being pursued, but you're not. God's actually pursuing those who are pursuing you. So you rest and you trust and you shout and you praise and you hallelujah all over the place because God has made up his mind about you. There's another praise break right there. Hallelujah. So now Exodus chapter 16, verse one. I'm reading from the New King James. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. It's spelled S-I-N. In English, for those who may not know, you would normally say S-I-N is sin. But this is a Hebrew word. And that word is Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. And the 15th day, watch this, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. Tell somebody, it's all a test. Say it again, it's all a test. Put it in the chat feed. You didn't even have to come to the building today. The least you could do is type in the chat feed. Type, it's all a test. The problem with the test is some of us have been skipping class. And if you skip class, you're not going to be ready for the test. And the reason why you keep having to relearn that lesson is because you were skipping school. You can't avoid development. You can't avoid maturity. You can't avoid growth. And if you do, you will stay stagnant. But for those of us who have embraced the painful necessity of class, we can graduate. And the lessons that we learn will lead us to higher heights. And as the old folks say, deeper depths. So, check this out. Children of Israel are complaining. Oh, I wish I was back in Egypt. At least I had meat. At least I had bread. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Let's freeze right here. The topic and title of this message, which is already almost done, is Moving Day, Part 5, The Revelation of Freedom. Last week, we talked about the responsibility of freedom. Now I want to talk about the revelation of freedom. What was God revealing, not only to the children of Israel, but what was he revealing to Moses? And what is he revealing to you in this season? Well, now you got to go back to Genesis where God said what it was going to be at the end from the beginning. Our God never starts anything that's not already finished. Say that again. God never starts anything that isn't already finished. He finishes it first, then he starts it. And so... God says to Abram, what's going to happen to your people? The children of Israel, it happened just as God said. Now they're coming out. They've got great possessions. Their bodies are free. Uh, Pharaoh's army is dead under the sea. And not just Little Mermaid, under the sea. No, they was gone. Chariots, gone. Horses, gone. All of that gone because you pursued the wrong one. You thought I didn't have backing and I had the God of the universe backing me. You pursued the wrong one. People better leave you alone. They're messing with the wrong one. You should put that in the chat feed. They, they're messing with the wrong one. They're messing with the wrong one. They better leave you alone. You're anointed. 
They better leave you alone. I know that you were broken. I know that you had moments of bondage. I know that you had moments of pain, moments of questions. I know that you had so many other areas of your life that are not congruent and don't make sense. And they thought that they could catch you off guard and take you out. But it can't happen because God has a promise over your life. And it's not just a promise that arrived when you were in the earth and when you were born. God made a promise to somebody a thousand years ago that he would redeem an entire nation. And you just happen to be the ones that God is going to reconcile his word through. You are the product of a promise that you had nothing to do with. So stop walking around in pride like you got wherever you are by yourself. You didn't just graduate from college by yourself. You didn't get that job by yourself. You didn't get that house by yourself. You didn't just happen to marry that person or have those kids. Everything was purposed. Everything was planned. Even your mistakes, God knew what you would do, and he still chose to reconcile his word through the human experience and even through the free will of individuals who wanted to stop God God still got his plan accomplished you ought to give God a praise right where you are that nothing can stop the plan the purpose and the will of God I don't care who it is what they got what they carrying on what they think they have what level of power what level of influence what level of opportunity they have to disband God's will God's word and God's way it's all a fallacy it is a foolish thing and a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the Lord you better leave God's people alone The Lord is not to be played with. And in Exodus 16, we find the children of Israel complaining. And there was a specific complaint. I wish we had bread. We had pots of meat and bread in Egypt. And it's very telling that Scripture tells us the exact day that this happened. It was the 15th day of the second month after they got free. So everybody type 45. It's 45. It was 45 days. They've been free 45 days, and they're already longing for what they were in bondage to for 430 years. How do you miss bondage while you're sitting in freedom? Because your body is free, but your mind is not. How do you miss that abusive relationship? Because you're sitting in your house watching Family Feud instead of being booed up with someone who makes you feel good for a moment and then brings tears for three weeks. And you forgot about the tears and you were remembering the moment that that relationship brought some semblance of happiness or laughter or relief or release or sexual fulfillment that was temporary and now God has freed you and 45 days later you miss it this is how people stay in situations that God never intended I gave you freedom but I gave you freedom but if I don't change your mind you're going to miss what was designed to kill you and to keep you in bondage and God wants to free his people and break this demonic chain that has been on the minds of God's people that whatever he freed you from, delivered you from, or graduated you from, that you got to go back. You don't have to go back. You're not called to go back. In fact, you're called to go forward. So here in Exodus 16, God has the children of Israel camped. They journeyed from Elim and everybody ended up at the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. Elim means palm, like palm branches. The wilderness of Sin, S-I-N, means thorn. And Sinai, the mountain of God, translates thorny. Now, I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. If you study the Old Testament and the deliverance of God's people, you will clearly see a shadow of what is to come through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so Moses is a Christ type, delivering God's people from bondage, taking them to their promise. We know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So the children of Israel journeyed from Elim, Palm, into 
the wilderness of Sin, thorn, on their way to the mountain of God, thorny. Now, let's parallel that with Jesus as he's coming into Jerusalem on the last week of his life. What kind of branches were they waving as he was coming in? Huh? Palms. I'm going somewhere. If I had a congregation, they would start shouting right now. So you need to shout at the house. Jesus started his journey with palm branches. But then it got a little thorny because he had to deal with the haters and the Pharisees that wanted to see him die. Sham trial, wilderness moment. He had it in the garden. Father, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. And on the ultimate dispensation of his purpose, he was on a cross wearing what? A crown of what? Because you cannot get to the mountain of God without thorns. There is a, there is a clear parallel between Exodus 16 and the work of Jesus Christ in all of the New Testament uh, scripture. From Matthew to John, John being the, the synoptic gospel, you can go to John 18, John 19, and you can see the trajectory. And you can go to Matthew and look and see how Jesus came into the city. Palm branches, but it ended in thorns. But the thorns were a crown. And the crown got him back to his rightful place, which is seated at the right hand of the Father. He went back up to the mountain. And where did Moses go to get the law? To the top of the mountain, the mountain, Sinai, thorny. And so all of this correlates. And you got to catch Jesus in the middle of your story. And I know you've been going through pain and I know you've been hurting and I know it doesn't make sense, but Jesus is in the middle of your journey. He's in the middle of your wilderness. He's in the middle of your pain. From palms to thorns, it's all in his will. Put this in the chat feed. It's all in his will. You better preach to nobody and everybody at the same time. I feel the Holy Ghost. It's all in his will. God said, Moses, I hear their complaints and I'm getting ready to bless them. Every morning when they wake up, after the dew dries, there will be a substance on the tops of the field. I want them to gather it. And the Bible says they ask the question, what is it? And the word, or the, the, the word for the, the question is mana, what we call manna. Mana means what is it? And what I love is that's who God is. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said, tell him I am that I am. Well, what does that mean exactly? It means whatever you need, I'm that. What is it? It's what you need. You're going to eat this for 40 years in the wilderness and everything you need to be sustained is in this substance. But you got to gather it when I say, the way I say, and then you can't keep any for the next day because knowing y'all, you'll try to hoard it because you're not used to freedom and you don't know who I am yet and you don't know how I do things. And so I'm going to need you to come to me every day. That's why Jesus said, give us this day our daily Bread, come on, somebody. I'm trying to give you a correlative uh, uh, connection between what's happening in Exodus 16 and what's happening with our Savior in this New Testament dispensation. Everything that's happening with the children of Israel is what's happening with us today across the world who still call on the name of Jesus. And so what is the revelation of freedom? Because Pastor John, you said you wanted to talk about the revelation of freedom. I'm glad you asked. The revelation of freedom is this. Why did God not just not let the children of Israel go through hell? Why did I have to go through this? Well, there was a purpose and an intent. But I don't understand what the purpose was. And that's where you and God part ways. He's God. You and I are not. And we don't get to get our questions answered just because we're in pain or we think we deserve it. God decided in his own sovereignty, seeing the wickedness of the human condition, 
that this was going to happen. He did not will for it to happen. He knew that it would happen because we are in the age of man. Dr. Tony Evans spoke and preached brilliantly about the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of man. The day of the Lord is when everything that God says is going to happen in that moment that way, but we are in the earth, and he gave who dominion in the earth? Us. So we got free will. We can make good decisions or bad decisions. That's why you got to choose ye this day whom you will serve. And so they wanted bread. They wanted meat. They wanted to eat. So God gave them manna. What is it? And I need you to ask God, what is it? Because he's about to provide for you in such a supernatural way. You won't even know where it came from or what it is. But I know this, you better eat it. Tell somebody you better eat it. You bet it'll have everything you need. Chew on that. Chew on God's word. Chew on God's provision. Chew on God's promise. It, it is from heaven. No man, no woman, no company, no corporate uh, entity will be able to take credit for what God is about to do in your life. God alone is going to get the glory. And the reason why God doesn't want you to hoard it is because you are too new in your freedom to be able to assume autonomy in your development. You need God every day. And even when you get to a place of strength, you're still going to need God every day. But it was 45 days into their freedom that they wanted to go back into bondage because of food. They wanted to taste meat in bondage instead of trust God in freedom. There's nothing in Egypt that you need. Everything that you needed from Egypt, you got. You got the lessons. You don't need to go back. Elim, Sinai, and in the middle is the wilderness of Sin. So from palm branches to thorns to thorny is actually elevation. So don't assume that thorns and prickly issues and situations are uh, the, the, the punishment of God. It's not. It's the development of God, and it's getting you closer to the promise of God. Here's the revelation. There's a couple of places of revelation. First of all, Genesis 15 lets me know that God doesn't get us into anything that he hasn't already gotten us out of. You can shout right there. Because what happened in Exodus 16, God prophesied in Genesis 15. And he prophesied the whole thing. It's going to happen just like this here. And when it's done, I'm going to get the glory. I'm going to take them Egyptians out. I'm going to judge that whole nation. And you coming out with great possessions. Everything he said came to pass. Why? Because God doesn't see chronologically. He doesn't see from point A to point B. He doesn't see in a linear way. God is not on this plane. He's above it. He's above it. He's beyond it. He is truly above and beyond, which is why he was able to tell Abram what was going to happen because he could see it all at the same time. That's the God you serve. That's why you need to trust him. He knows where he's taking you. He knows what you're going through, and he's got a plan to get you out. In fact, the plan started with you getting free. <laughs> the plan started at the end. So don't, don't, don't miss this. Where you're at in your journey, the end has already been decided. Stay with God. Stay in his will. You're going to come out on the other side with great possessions. I need a praise break from the six people on the left-hand side of this premium church. Hallelujah. And I need y'all to get a praise in your mouth too. Throw some hallelujahs up in that house. Put that spoon down. You don't need to be eating no cereal right now. You need to be praising. Somebody go, oop, oop, hallelujah. Your cornflakes done fell all over the floor. Get your hallelujah out. The revelation of freedom is twofold. Number one, God never gets you, never lets you walk into anything he hasn't already gotten you out of. So if you're not out, it's not because he doesn't have a plan. It's because that's not where you are at in your journey. You might be in the wilderness of Sin between Elim and Sinai. Sinai was the mountain of God. Sinai was the goal because Sinai is where God spoke to Moses. 
and said, this will be the sign that I'm with you, that you will bring the children of Israel here to worship me on this mountain. So what God was saying, again, I have a plan for their deliverance. So no matter how much they complain, cry, moan, I'm still going to bring them out. I know these people. Their bodies are free, but their minds are not. They don't even know how to provide for themselves. They have no framework for freedom. Everyone they know has been in bondage. Everyone they know has been enslaved. For as long as they can remember, they don't even know anybody that was free. And some of you would choose bondage over freedom because you don't know what's on the other side of deliverance. So you've chosen the safety of that addiction, the safety of the porn, the safety of the relationship that you know doesn't honor God, the safety of the familiar, the safety of what you know will show up. But what does it really cost you to go back? Are you going to trust God for daily provision? Are you going to take the scraps from Egypt? It's easy to take those scraps, but it costs you your soul. And I know I'm talking right. Here's a revelation to me for Moses. Moses was the man in Egypt for 40 years. He was that dude. Understand, he was that dude. For 40 years, he knew, I'm about to blow up. And then all of a sudden, he was a fugitive from justice on the run. Why? Because there was an Egyptian that was in a leadership position that was tormenting two Hebrews, and he did a 187 on an undercover cop. And so then he had to leave because they was coming to get him. How would you feel? If you grew up in a place, you knew you were about to be the girl. You was about to be that dude. And then it all went away. Now you're sitting in a wilderness with all of your wisdom and all of your skills and all of your talent. You don't think regret would creep into your mind? It sounds nice for some of the stuff y'all be saying. I have no regrets. I don't think that's a wise way to live. I think if you are a a fully functioning human being that wants to grow and develop, you should have some regrets. Regrets that lead to repentance. Repentance that leads to true change. There are certain things I wish I had never did, things I wish had never happened. I absolutely have regrets. But the regret alone is not enough for change. Regret without repentance is just an emotion. But regret with repentance lead to transformative change. So if you do have regrets, turn those regrets into repentance and then let the repentance turn you towards a better path, a better way, a better understanding, a better way of living. Hallelujah. Moses probably had deep regrets. And I bet you, and some of those nights in the wilderness, he'd look up in the sky and say, if I ever get a chance to go back, if I had that moment over, I would do it differently. How many of us would say if we had a couple moments back in our lives, we'd do things differently? I know I would. Guess what God gave? He gave Moses an opportunity to get it right. Sent him back to the place of his greatest shame, greatest failure and gave him his greatest victory. I want you to know the place that brought you to tears, that made you feel like you could never get it back. God's going to send you right back. He's going to send you to that place that you thought was going to be marked by shame for the rest of your life, and he's going to make it the greatest place of deliverance, freedom, and breakthrough you have ever imagined. This is the revelation of freedom. What God did when he caused Moses to run, he was actually freeing him ahead of time so that he would be a forerunner in the wilderness to give and have grace for people in the wilderness because he knows what it's like to be in the wilderness. Catch that. God had to send somebody first. And for some of you, you've been trying to figure out why it's so lonely. It's because you're going first. 
I feel the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Felice. I'm glad. Was that Felice or, or, or oh, that was my, that was my home. That was Aaliyah. I just needed somebody to agree with me. The reason why you're in pain is because you don't have anybody to talk to. Nobody understands because you're the first one going through it. You won't even know why you're going through the hell you're going through until 600,000 broken people show up behind you saying, how did you survive? How did you make it out of that? How did you get through that? How in the world are you still living? Why do you still have a smile? Why do you have tears and a smile? Because with what I've gone through, I'm always going to have a mixture of both because brokenness does something to your soul and it keeps you real humble when God took you from death to life and you know you shouldn't even be here. It it causes you to treat people differently. It causes you to have more patience. It causes you to have a different perspective on people. I love that the musicians are playing. That was a loving production in the ears telling them pastor is talking too long. <laughs> I love this amazing team and they know I'll preach all day. Where are you going? It's a storm. Well, let me say this. There is in this moment a revelation of freedom. And the revelation is this. He didn't free you so you can walk around like you the girl or like you're the man. He freed you so that you can be an agent of freedom for others. If God has ever delivered you from anything, it's now time for you to tell your story and share your testimony. And don't just share the good part. Share the parts you're not proud of. That's the only way real people are going to get free. The reason why churches aren't packed is because they know it's a bunch of bull crap. All you're going to do is shout, hear something nice, but nobody's going to tell you the truth about what's really going on. Not here. You're going to get this word. The revelation of freedom is that there is not one thing that you are in that God has not made a plan to get you out of. And for Moses, God redeemed the worst moment of his life and took him back to the place of his greatest pain and gave him his greatest victory. The revelation of freedom is that you don't need Egypt, but Egypt was necessary for your development. Now that you're developed, don't go back. No butterfly goes back to his chrysalis. No baby goes back in the womb, doesn't get reattached to the umbilical cord. Your development had its purpose, and now it's time for you to be everything God intended. The revelation of freedom is even if you don't feel it, doesn't mean that it's not so. Your body is free. And now it's time for your mind to be free. Don't be conformed to the ways of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in the same way Moses brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai, thorny, our king went to Golgotha with a crown of thorns, fulfilling the law and the prophets. So everything about you is already finished. So when Jesus said in John chapter 19, it is finished, he wasn't just talking about his purpose. He was talking about yours too. So I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for the revelation that Egypt was actually an incubator. Egypt was my incubator, but it is not my final place of planting. I got what I needed. Now I'm moving into my promise. And while I'm in the wilderness, you will provide for me every day. So I will not get upset that I don't have excess. I will be grateful and rejoice that today I have what I need. And I will trust that tomorrow you will make sure that I have what I need until I get into my promise and I can sustain myself. Seal this word in the lives of your people in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Listen, everybody is virtual today. And so if you've heard this word and your spirit has been pricked and you're saying, Pastor John, I, I don't, even know what to do next. The first thing is that you need to make a decision on who's going to run your life. Is it going to be you? Or is it going to be the Word of God? 
And if it's the Word of God, the totality of the Word of God is found in the person of Jesus. So if you need Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or if you want to be a member of this church because membership has nothing to do with proximity to this building in Greenville, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I receive the free gift of salvation, not through my works, but the finished work of the cross. The blood is enough to pay for all my sins. And now, Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me how to be more like Jesus each and every day. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I know in my heart that if you prayed that prayer, you're saved. Therefore, I want you to text the word saved to 95555. If this is salvation for you. If you're saying, Pastor John, I want to identify with this church as my place of covering and place of planting. I want to be a part of this congregation. I want to use my gifts and skills to build this vision. Text the word member to 95555. I'm so grateful that you took time and that you received the word of the Lord. The revelation of freedom is that no matter what state of your life that you're in, God didn't allow you to walk into it without already having a plan to get you out of it. Rest in that. And let the remainder of this day and the rest of the first week of the fourth quarter be a reminder of the loving power and the grace of God to move in your life in unexpected ways. With that being said, we again offer our prayers and we will be offering our resources to those who have been horrifically impacted by Hurricane Ian that became Tropical Storm Ian that became Hurricane Ian again. Be safe, be prayerful, be vigilant, be wise. And thank God right now where you are because no matter what you think you got going on, there is somebody who would trade places with you right now. I love you with the love of the Lord. And I'm grateful for a church with enough maturity to stay connected, whether you're in a building or not. Because one day soon, all of this is going away. And you better have enough word to keep you and your family sustained in your house. With that being said, may the great God that I serve do miracle signs and wonders in the fourth quarter of the year. For those who are saying, Pastor, I missed the giving moment, you can give at any time. You can go to the app, to the website, do whatever you need to do if you feel so led. And we're going to do our best to meet as many needs as we can of those who have been hurt. Thank you for always being a church that is generous so that other people can be blessed in times of great crisis. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord God be gracious to you, show you his favor and give you his peace. Love you so much. Have an amazing, God-blessed week. And we'll see you, if the Lord says the same, next week.